Hi everyone. Today's podcast is a very, very interesting podcast. We're going to discuss communication. And specifically, I'm not going to focus on to-do lists and, you know, 10 steps on how to improve your communication because really great communication coaches don't give you advice like that. You really need to understand the person before you tell them how they're going to improve their communication, right? You have no choice. Everyone is different. No 10-step list, 5-step list is going to work for everyone. In fact, I didn't want to use this word, but it's really about understanding the psychology of communication or the psychology of the interaction between two people as they communicate to understand how communication takes place. And today's podcast, we're going to focus on how to influence the interviewer, which is something I've been discussing quite a lot with candidates. I thought it would make a really good podcast. I'm going to layer this podcast and sort of build up into it because I think it's a very, very important topic. And I see it very badly discussed in forums and so on. And when I discuss this concept with people, they find it very, very unusual that we approach the subject from this way. So I think it's a good idea to share it with everyone. So let's begin by discussing a candidate who I will call, let's not give her a name, right? This candidate is about 32, 33 years old, based out of Europe. She is a very interesting candidate. When we did our screening calls with them, looking at the screening call notes, it's about five pages of notes we collected on her, assessing her abilities and so on, you know, quite extensively testing her skills. One thing that struck me about her is her maturity and her ability to hold a conversation with us. She was very, very good at coming across crisply, candidly, confidently, but also talking to me like I was a peer. At no point did I feel that I'm talking to someone who was apprehensive, scared of the process, or really was unsure of herself. She handled herself really, really well, right? And how does she do that? Well, when I have a conversation with her, she pauses, she takes time and says, well, let me think about that. So she generates, in the first few seconds of the call, she does a lot of little things that implies she's structured, mature, and intelligent, right? So... Even her responses, she will question some of the things I put forward. She won't just accept it and say, well, Michael, why would you say that? Because this is what I believe, or this is what I read. It does not reconcile what you're saying. So she doesn't question me in an abrupt way, but she asks questions, which is a very good sign. And she does it in a very mature way as well. She doesn't say, Michael, I have just one question for, or could I ask you a question? No, she says, Michael, that, that makes sense. You know, so when you're mature and you see someone as a peer, you just move into a question as a natural part of your conversation. When you see someone as superior to you, you'll ask permission to ask a question, right? So she handles this really, really well, right? Now, the thing with this candidate is that she does this on purpose. She knows full well that she needs to manage her image very carefully because if she mismanages her image, for example, if she creates a weak image, she knows that we will respond to that weak image. So she creates a very strong image. And in fact, throughout the training sessions, at times she struggled. And when I highlight a mistake she makes, she really struggles in terms of how to respond. So think very carefully about this candidate's strategy. She deliberately works extra hard to create that right first impression so that you would believe she is very intelligent. She is intelligent, by the way. But because you believe she's very intelligent, you never really question her. Because if you do dig behind, you'll notice that she struggles to respond to that. And what I've seen with this candidate is that once you get past that wall, If you start digging behind, she's never been prepared for that. She's been so good at managing this first impression that people never have to question her. And because people never question her, she's never had to learn the skills to handle this this questioning. And that is her weakness. So as long as you never go behind the scenes and, you know, ask her, why do you say this? But this doesn't make sense. Explain to me how this works. She's fine. But as soon as you start probing and digging and pointing out flaws, she just struggles to understand it, right? The subtle danger with this client is that while she handles the first part well, right, she handles the second part poorly. The second, the first part is creating the right impression. The second part is how do you deal when you're ultimately going to be questioned, right? Now, let's talk about a counterpoint, another candidate, right? This candidate I will call Rafik, and he started off his training really badly with us. I mean, he's always late. His laptop's not connected. The first four or five sessions, I always say, Rafik, do you know you're late? Do you know you're the only candidate who's consistently late? Do you understand that your laptop is not connected correctly? Do you understand you should be using an Ethernet cable and not Wi-Fi? We've discussed this. Do you know that the notes you're meant to send me have not been sent? Do you know that we've just spent 15 minutes setting up technical things when you have 45 minutes in the call? Now, let me explain something to somebody very important to you. Because of the way 
the female candidate started her calls with us on the ball, relaxed, interesting conversation. She created the impression she was in control. She created the impression she was intelligent. She, she created this impression in our heads. We responded to her like she was intelligent. And because we responded to her like she was intelligent, she did well. It's only later we decided to test things, we changed things. Now, this is a very important point about how we respond to people. Rafik, when he was mismanaging his preparation and so on, I was not happy about it. Right? I was a bit testy with him. You know, I was a little bit irritated. You know, here's a guy, 15 minutes late, doesn't tell me he's running late or anything like that, doesn't look organized, hasn't taken any notes. The call doesn't go well. Why does the call not go well? The call goes badly because Rafik has created the impression he's incompetent and he's not doing well. And because he's created this impression, I have responded to this impression with the belief that he is not intelligent, right? Now, this is a very important point I want to make here, right? Rafik and the female candidate are juxtaposed. One created the right impression because they created the right impression. We treated them like they're intelligent. The other one, because they started off poorly with us, we thought they're incompetent and you know disorganized, and we treated them like they were incompetent and disorganized. And what do you think happened? The person we treated like they were intelligent responded very well until we changed gears and we said, what if we question her? How will she respond? With Rafik, we did the same thing. I mean, you can watch Rafik's video online as well if you're a client of Firms Consulting going through a special program we have. But we sat down with him and we said, look, you got to do four things. If you can do these four things by yourself without me prompting you, I can assure you, you're going to start off the call magnificently. He did it. And what happens? Because he starts off the call well, he creates the impression of being competent and organized. Because he creates the impression of being competent and organized, I treat him like he's competent and organized. And what happens with his case preparation? He does well. Now, this is a very important point here, right? Because I've made part of the point, I still have to make the other half of the point, which is equally important. People always tell me, you know, Michael, some people, when I do cases with them, they really rattle me. Other people, when I do cases with them, I do it very nicely. I have no problem with it. So how do I make sure I'm not rattled? And I always tell them, well, the reason you're rattled is because of the signals you are given to the person who is rattling you. Now, let me explain this. And this is the second half of the insight, which is really, really important. When Rafik was unorganized, disorganized, and you know, making a mess of things, what, how do you think I treated him in a case? Well, firstly, my tone would harden immediately. Second, I would not give him the benefit of the doubt. Third, when he wanted something, even if I cut him off two seconds faster than the female candidate, the point is, because of the signals he's given me that he is not prepared and wasting my time, in my head, I've decided he's not prepared and is wasting my time. And my behavior towards him reinforces the fact that he's not ready and he's wasting my time, right? So what does he do? He acts like he's not ready and he's wasting my time. So this is the second point. The signal he sends me forces me to change my behavior towards him. My tone, my pitch, even the questions I give him, even my willingness to help him, you know? The guy's wasted 15 minutes of my time and am I going to take time to help him? At the end of the day, we're all human. Interviews are the same. And even though... We obviously maintain very high standards at Firms Consulting. Our worst day is better than most trainers' best days. But even so, we are still manipulated by that. Now, this is a very important point. When you feel someone is treating you badly in a case, it's because you have not given them the right signals early on. In fact, if they're already treating you badly, there's nothing you can do. Their image of you has been cast in stone. So let's just talk about this very important concept that you must understand. When you engage anyone, right? You give them a signal in the first few seconds about how they perceive you. They then take that signal and process it and they decide how they're going to perceive you. Based on the way they perceive you, that's the way they'll act towards you. And I'm sure you can see this perfectly. I mean, think about it, right? You know, imagine you meet someone in a supermarket. The person comes up to you, jumps in front of you and starts blabbering about needing help on something, but they can't explain anything. They look like they're on drugs. Because of the signal the person presents to you, You've decided maybe the person is on drugs, maybe they're crazy, maybe they have a gun. You've got to stay away from this person. Your actions are driven by your belief on that person. On the other hand, if you're in a supermarket shopping and a very well put together young, let's say, lady comes up to you, very polite, very prim, very proper, well articulated, and explains to you she needs some help trying to find her son, for example, right? You'll help her because of the signals she's given you, you know, articulate, well spoken, well put together. In your head, you've decided, you know what? This person knows what they're doing. They seem like they need help. Let me help them. 
when someone, this is a very important point, when someone is treating you badly, it's because the signals you've given them earlier creates the impression that that is the way you should be treated. Right. I mean, we can apply this level of thinking to relationships. You know, you get treated badly in a relationship. It's because you allow the person to treat you badly and you give the signals that it's OK. You get treated well in a relationship is because you give the signals to someone. You know what? I'm important. My time counts. This is a relationship of equals. Therefore, you know, treat me well. And if you give those signals, the person profiles you in that way and treats you in that way. Now, right. Now, what do I mean by signals? Right. Signals are a very important concept in economics. If you read the work of Barry Nelbuff at the Yale School of Management, he's done a lot of work in this area. Let me give you an example of what signals are, because we talk about signals, right? And you always wonder, what does Michael mean by signals? Does he mean the way I dress my resume and so on? Well, there are many kinds of signals. If you write to a lecturer at a very weakly ranked school, I'm not going to name any schools, I don't want to offend anyone. So if you write to anyone from a weak school, you'll notice that lecturers have a higher statistical probability of putting PhD behind their names, right? If you write to a lecture at Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, there's a lower statistical probability of him putting PhD behind his name. Do you know why that is? Humans are all about trying to improve their status, their image, right? They're always about trying to do that. If you work at Harvard, you don't need to put PhD behind your name to improve your image. Everyone knows that Harvard's not going to hire you as a senior lecturer or lecturer unless you have some extraordinary skills in business some amazing intellect, or you have a PhD. If you work at an unknown school, you want to signal to people that you're intelligent. And because you're in the name of your school or where you work cannot signal that, you'll put PhD. It's one of the famous stories Barry tells you. If you ever meet Barry, ask him to tell you that story. He's a great guy, right? What are the other signals? Well, let's look at TV ads, right? Would you ever see Louis Vuitton sending out a mass email to people saying, unbelievable, amazing new product being launched by Louis Vuitton. No, you'll never see that. But you will see it by copycat companies who are selling handbags for $50 and $10, right? It's another signal. The signal Louis Vuitton is sending to the market is we don't hype things up because our products are amazing. The other subtle signal they're sending to you, which is a flattery signal, is that we know you're intelligent. We know you understand quality. We don't have to hype up things. They're kind of flattering you to get you to buy from them, right? Other signals. Suits businessmen wear. The suit you wear signals something about your standing in business and standing in life. That is why people take so much time to dress. Hippies would tell you that they're not worried about signals, but the fact that they're a hippie and tell you they're a hippie and act like they're a hippie is a signal that they're sending they don't care. Also a signal, just a very different signal. Let's think about other kinds of signals that you get. Think about the ads you see for those products that are sold on television at 2 a.m. They always hype it up. They always tell you about buy five, get two free or buy 10, get two free and so on. The way they profile those ads, they're signaling that, you know what? This is a cost game, more than a quality game. Therefore, look at the cost. In a manner of speaking, they're segmenting their market through their signals. The signal you send determines who's going to pay attention to you and who's not going to pay attention to you. Think about McKinsey. They'll hire the best from the best business schools and best schools. They will aggressively train them they will aggressively recruit people and reject people that don't fit the model. So that when you get a McKinsey person or a BCG person or a Bain person standing in front of you in a boardroom, you know that this person was not the best, aggressively trained, and thousands of people couldn't get in. McKinsey does all of these things as a signal. They could do this privately, never ever divulge how they operate, but they don't. Because this is a signal to the market that they are serious about what they do. Signals are very, very important. Now, how does this apply to you in a case interview? Now, let me distill the essence down here for you. When you get into a case, right? Let's imagine, um, let's imagine Sheila is doing a case with me. Imagine I'm still a principal and I'm interviewing a final round. So Sheila comes in. Now, Sheila has spent a lot of time preparing for case interviews. She spent all her time preparing for case interviews and she is a whiz on it, right? She comes in. Now, because she spent so much time preparing on case interviews, she's not really organized in fact, she's so disorganized, she's not really good at small talk. So she starts the discussion, meandering around, not really you know, paying attention to eye contact, looks a bit disheveled from the way she dressed. Neat, but not as neat as she could be. A little bit disorganized, not paying so much attention to what I'm saying. In fact, she's short on a small talk. It's almost as if I'm trying to have a conversation with her and she's kind of cutting me off by being too quick in her responses. So my impression I create of Sheila is that, you know what, she seems like a nice lady, but she doesn't really want to be here. In other words, she's wasting my time. Now, because I've created that impression in my head, when I go through and do the cases with her, 
that impression is going to dictate how I respond to her. I am obviously not going to be so attentive to someone who is not interested to be there, someone who doesn't seem interested in me. And no matter how good she is at cases, and this is the key thing, because of the way I am managing her through the cases, she's ending up having a bad case interview. On the other hand, if Sheila had come in there and was witty and charming and smiled with her pearly whites and, you know, flirted a little and so on, you know, subtly, obviously, you know, and I've seen she's interested, she likes to be her, she's a bubbly personality, my behavior towards her changed. In my mind, I think, you know, here's a really nice, talented young lady, amazing resume, wants to be her, has a lot of interesting stories, you know, I wish I could spend more time listening to her, but I have to do this case, unfortunately. The way I do that case completely changed, and this is the mistake people make. The interviewer's behavior towards you gets hardwired before you even start that case. You need to make sure it's hardwired in your benefit before you start the case. Because when the case begins, how they want to run that case has already been set up. It has nothing to do with the way you are doing that case. In fact, because the way they want to treat you in the case has already been predetermined, more, all other things being equal, the way you do in the case will be predetermined. Comes back to the first point. You tend to do well in front of people that think you're intelligent. It's a well-known fact. People that think you're intelligent, and you'll and you ask yourself, how does it change the way I do behave by doing a case in front of someone who thinks I'm intelligent? Well, it's very simple. If someone thinks you're intelligent, they'll act like you're intelligent. Mannerisms, behavior, giving you more of the benefit of the doubt, helping you. If I don't think you want to be there, I don't think you're really committed, I create the impression of someone who doesn't want you to be there, and I make your life a misery. This is a very important point. So when you prepare for cases, remember you've got to lay the groundwork in a session by presenting those signals to the interviewer that you want to be there. You want to be very structured in your informal communication, very analytical, very articulate. And most people mess this up. You know, I remember once doing an interview with someone and they couldn't even pour a cup of coffee for me. Their hands were shaking so much, it looked like they were going to drop it. And I actually remember making a joke, you know, it's a good thing we're not going to assess you on your coffee pouring skills here. I made a joke to lighten the mood because I thought she may collapse, you know, in that interview. But the point is, in my head, I've already thought to myself, okay, she's nervous. I mean, she obviously, she's not wasting my time, but this candidate is not someone I can put in front of a client. I've already decided that. And I'm just going through the case because unless she's like going to solve this case better than Michael Porter, you know, I'm decided I don't want to do this. So what's going to happen is that in psychologically setting up a case that's not going to be as easy for her, and the only way that will change is unless she's so brilliant on the case, I actually do a retake and say, you know what, maybe my perception of her is wrong. But because I'm approaching the case in a manner whereby I actually don't think she's really worth my time, she really is not going to be worth my time. And candidates need to understand this. It's the psychology of cases. How you do in a case is set up by how you've done before the case has even started. It's that small talk. I profile you. I decide whether you're worth spending time with and whether you're intelligent. And if I think you're intelligent, I act like you're intelligent. And because I act like you're intelligent, you respond favorably. This is not news to anyone. Well, it shouldn't be. It's a well-known you know, fact in terms of the way people respond. You know that, for example, one of the reasons you are friendly with the friends you have is because they treat you well. People would challenge you and question you. You generally don't be friends with them because you wonder why they're questioning and challenging you. And the trick here is that in the interviewer's relationship, you want to influence the interviewer early in the chit-chat section so that they create a favorable impression of you and they respond as if you're intelligent, thereby making you more intelligent. So how do you create a favorable impression? Well, structure is the most important thing. I always tell people, if you can show structure and analytical thinking, approach me like I'm a peer. And structure simply means, you know, when I ask you a question, have a way you're going to answer the question. Give me your insights. You know, I always ask people the newspaper article, tell me about a newspaper story you read. And people are so happy with the fact that they could recite what was in Bloomberg. I'm not interested in what was in Bloomberg. I'm interested in maybe a very brief synopsis of the article in Bloomberg, but then I don't know what you thought about it. So never underestimate those first few minutes before a case begins, because in that time, everything you do, the way you sit, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you say, uh, all the time, the way you pause, the way you make these awkward giggles, the way you flip a pen out of your hand out of nervousness, and don't giggle about that. It's happened to Candace. They're so nervous about it. things, the pen you know, flips out of their hand because they're shaking it around. Candidates do a whole manner of things that indicates that either they're not prepared, they're not interested. And it may not be that you're not interested in the case. It's the fact that you've decided 
those first few minutes are not important when they're actually really important. And even when I speak to candidates, I mean, I'll start off with five minutes with them, I'll have a general discussion. And do you know what a huge impact that first five minutes is having in terms of helping me profile this person and decide if they're worth listening to? Because obviously, if you come across as completely lame in a simple discussion, why in the world would I think you're going to come across like a savant when it comes to the case, comes down to the cases? So you have to manage this very well. And my point here, and I thought this was a very important podcast, is do not listen to communications guidance that teaches you, you know, like 10 ways to lose weight or 10 ways to lose a guy or whatever it is. The point is communication is far more psychologically driven than you think it is. And you have to understand the psychology. Bottom line is that the way you act creates an impression in people's minds. That impression determines the way they act towards you. And the way they act towards you will determine how you'll perform. In other words, you want people to think you're intelligent. And if they think you're intelligent, they'll act towards you in their behavior as if you're intelligent. And because of their behavior, you will end up having an easy session. I would recommend listening to this podcast more than once. It's a very important podcast. And I think it is crucial that people understand this. Because everyone is worried about cases and they kind of ignore those first few minutes when they're busy faffing around and not paying any attention and looking like they had marijuana and so on. The point is, you want to be on call all the time. You want to always be building a very strong reputation for yourself.